What happens when $15,000 worth of dental implants start failing just months after placement? Today we're breaking down a complex case that went sideways and the critical lessons every patient needs to know before getting implants. Hi, I'm Dr. Daniel Choi, board certified periodontist since 2011, and I'm sitting down with Dr. Saeed, our prosthodontist, to analyze a challenging case. A patient in her 60s who came in with exposed implant threads, bone loss, and a severe bite discrepancy. We'll walk you through exactly what went wrong from implant positioning to the overlooked biomechanical issues that doomed this case from the start. In this video, you'll learn the warning signs of failing dental implants that you can't ignore, why a class two bite relationship changes everything about implant treatment, the difference between a quick fix and a long-term solution, whether this case could have been saved or if starting over was the only option. And stick around until the end because we reveal whether an all on four choice would have been the better choice from the beginning and what that means for patients in similar situations. Let's dive into the case. All right, so I wanna show you this case. This is a patient that was referred by one of our um, referrals, our mm -hmm. GP referrals, and great guy. Um, so he has this case that he placed um, some implants on, I think four to six months ago. Um, previously, this patient has, I'm just presenting this case to you just for like, you know, information. So some patients can learn about this type of stuff. Um, what to look out for and, you know, treatment options. But in this case, basically um, he placed, I get, I'm assuming there was like an implant bridge up here that failed. Um, he placed three implants to basically create an implant bridge. He let it heal for a few months. And suddenly when the patient came back, he noticed that there were these fenestrations of the gum. Okay. Uh, for the patients out there, that means basically opening in the gums. Um, he asked me like, hey, can we do a gum graft on this case? Um, because the implants have already been integrating for a few months. And I right. said, uh, I don't, you know, if, only, if it's only been a few months, we're already starting to see this is like a warning sign. Yeah. So, you know, you know, I have, I'm a feeling that we have a, we have to remove these implants, but, you know, send the patient over. So patient came over, ran a CBCT, definitely um, see some bone issues also, you know, obviously what we anticipated, but I just wanted like your take on this. So again, I'm thinking you're probably thinking the same thing that we're thinking this patient had. Um, a bridge up front that failed. Um, and when we look at the 3D scan, you could see what we anticipated. Like, so for the folks out there watching this right here, like the, we're looking at this patient from the side. So like this is their lips, right? So their nose would be here. And that would be like, kind of like if we're looking at it from this angle. Yeah. So anyways, uh, yeah, there's literally no buccal bone at all on these implants, right? So. You can see the threads outside, so yep. there's no way they could be going there. Yeah, there's no bone at all. So, um, but you know, I just wanted to get your take on it because, like, what I was anticipating right here, I was like looking at this patient from this view, is like, man, that's uh, some serious overbite right there. Yeah. I mean, we know that when someone's biting on a CBC, I mean, taking a CBCT, that their bite could be a little bit off. Anyways, so what are your, like, you know, Based off of what you see, you know, obviously this patient was in a bridge and so they lost bone from this outer edge, that buccal bone just resorbed over time. Um, it's a very severe class two. Yeah. Yeah. Which just yeah. means that the lower jaw is pretty... Retreated. Set towards the tongue and the upper jaw is far out. Right. So that makes it difficult for kind of the teeth to be meeting in more of a um, ideal relationship. Yeah. Um, the other thing I see is that there's... This, this pretty much the bite is really on those those that lower left side that the right side is is one implant crown and that's about it yeah right yeah. here so i'm I'm assuming that occlusion obviously isn't really uh patient doesn't have a stable bite right now mm -hmm. uh, do we have more photos of this patient yeah um actually just that one okay yeah yeah i mean i i it's actually just uh it's pretty collapsed. So I think they had to make, so I think to put this into reference, I can see that there's spacing on both sides. So I think for this photo, they would they had to have the patient not bite down all the way. Because I'm assuming that when the patient bites down, these get too far close to the, closer to the incisor edge. So I think there's also like a lack of restorative space there um, when, the, when the patient bites down. Or- For this bridge up here? Mm-hmm. Okay. Because you see like it's it's equally, open on both sides. Yeah. So it seems like they had to intentionally make the patient not close all the way to get this snapshot. Mm -hmm. um, and with that class two relationship and with the lack of restorative room, we typically have to open the bite up, which 
is another can of worms because class two opening the bite is is tough because what I'm trying to say is that because your lower jaw is pretty set towards the backside, the more you open, the more you exacerbate that um, that relationship of the jaw, relationship, the yeah. deviation from the jaws. Yeah. So you ideally you don't want to open too much in a class two. Mm-hmm. So in, in this case, you know, um, uh, he, he needs kind of more of a detailed workup before those implants are placed. So if we redo those implants, I think first thing is determining where, how to get the patient to a stable bite. Okay, so this is where I love to get like your insight again. So like as a prosthodontist in regards to like, because we're just, you know, when we're placing implants, we're just like, okay, the guy lost, this patient lost a bridge. Yeah. So his natural tooth bridge. Um, Granted, we got some bone loss right now. I just need to place these implants and give this person a new implant bridge. So um, again, like, so what's your, like, so tell me exactly what your thoughts are again, because this patient is class two, which then. So whenever we see a class two patient, it kind of, you know, as. Meaning an overbite. Overbite, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, it's always a difficult relationship to treat. It's not untreatable, but it requires a little bit more workup than just, you know, your average class one or even class three patients. Which is the underbite. Class three is like your, you know, lower jaw is kind of forward set. Right. Um, Class two, inherently, it starts off with a big discrepancy where your upper jaw is far set. And because your lower jaw is the one that moves up and down, right. the more you open it, the farther you go away from the upper teeth. That makes sense. Yeah. Right. So, and that actually makes it even more worse. Mm-hmm. So, you, you're not really, when you, because within class three, when you open it, you're just kind of, there's only a vertical kind of deficiency. But here, there's also like that horizontal component that gets... Right excessively worse as you kind of open the bite to kind of create room for that. Could you explain why you have to open the bite though? <sighs> because obviously when the patient's like that, if I give them teeth, I'm going to have to basically bridge this horizontal gap. Right. And there's no way to do that without kind of opening the bite. Mm-hmm. But the problem is the more you open, the farther away you're right. going. So you're, you're excessively longer teeth and your teeth are going to have to be flared out way more than they need to. Right. And then your implants are right here. But your bones here, yeah, back so, there. So your bones like right here, your teeth are right here. So when you bite down, there's like this big horizontal component to that force aspect as well, which, right. which obviously isn't ideal with implants. They want force to be loaded in the long, the long axis of the implant. Right. Um, so yeah, it's it's a tough case. Yeah. yeah. So um, what would you do with the? Do you think the fenestrations can be treated with anything? I, I mean, I can actually see those threads literally sticking out of yeah. what comes there. So the really cool thing is I've been able to get really awesome results by doing free gingival grafting, not connective tissue grafting, not using cadaver tissue, alloderm, you know, but like doing a free gingival graft in these areas have been very predictable. Um, but with this supporting a bridge and this being several months into the process, right. it's another thing for if this patient came in years later and they've been in this bridge, I by no means, we're going to be like, okay, like, how do we save this, right? But I feel like this situation right now is like trying to build a new home and our foundation is already cracking. Oh, 100%, yeah. Right. With the class two, with the fenestrations, it's like, it's a surgical and a restorative nightmare. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do you think the implants are too wide for this site? Yeah, that's another thing. So basically, um, looking at the 3D scan, we always love to look at this cross section, the sagittal cross section. Um, see like what people need to understand is that we can't just place the implant where the bone is, right? So the bone always resorbs from the outer edge in. So this is like their patient's lips. Here's like the tongue. So like the bone always resorbs on this side first and it starts sinking in this way. But the problem is that we want to make sure that that implant is where the teeth is are going to be and not positioning this implant way back here where the bone was lost. So what ends up happening? I mean, and you can see this makes sense that this was Pretty like a thin. bridge, right? Yeah, this bone is really thin where the front mandibular incisors used to be, yeah. the front lower teeth used to be. So the bone is really thin. And if we place this implant way back here, then yeah, like you're not, yeah, there's a huge discrepancy between where this upper tooth is and this lower tooth is. So uh, for the folks out there, what we ideally do is the type of bone grafting that would be needed here is guided bone regeneration. What's the size of that implant, that, that one, the back one? Um, like this one right here? No, the other one. This one right here? Yeah. Uh, yeah, 4.7. Yeah, so that that's a pretty wide implant. So yeah. I would have definitely sized down. Um, Maybe like a four? 
like a three seven. Three seven. Yeah. And then like three seven and go deeper. And you can even angle it and that would even make it better for the, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Hundred yeah. percent. You're absolutely right. If they um had angled this implant in so it's more along this long axis. Yeah. Right. And then where the, the crown of the tooth, because that would have definitely been better for this patient. Because right now your true axis hole is going to be popping up through way lingually. Yeah. It's like, and then. Uh, so it's you, like this. Yeah. Right. You want it closer like this yeah. when you look at it from the side, not this. Um, yeah. So ultimately what ended up happening is because this implant is more displaced out here towards the buckle, there's no bone. And if there's no bone, the gums are going to follow it. And that's yeah, exactly that implant is actually a little bit more worse. The front one, yeah, yeah this, this, one, one, this one, for sure, it's almost like half of the implant is out, out, out of the bone, right, right now, <clears throat> right. Versus like this one, which is better. My only criticism of this is I would have sunk it deeper and you know done GBR on the facial of this implant. Yeah, and probably let let a patient stay without teeth for a bit, maybe a denture. Yeah, that's another thing to consider, right? Yeah. So if you do a big guided bone regeneration case, um, you ideally don't want the patient wearing like a flipper or something and like pounding on that area. It's like stepping on wet concrete, right? Yeah. But yeah. Um, and this again is not bad. Like I would just, again, sunk it deeper, um, this far left one. I'm assuming they placed this other implant right here because the bone was definitely like less right here also. I'm not worried about a one tooth cantilever. I think that implant failed or that tooth failed. Oh, this. Yeah. There was one that failed here. Yeah. Oh, okay. seems, yeah. Like, seems like there's yeah. like this very You're implant right. sized effect. Mm -hmm. Very possible. And then there's a the mental nerve right there, mm -hmm. which comes into play if you're trying to augment that site. You gotta stay away from it. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, basically, um, I told the patient that, listen, it's still early in the process. You know, you're in your 60s. You wanna take this to the grave with you. You wanna make sure that you have adequate thickness of bone. Um, and, you know, they're on the right track. We want to build up the gum, make sure there's good keratinized gingival around it. But unfortunately, I thought that just trying to use that this early in the process was just putting a Band-Aid over it and it was going to be a longer term issue. Yeah. Um, she said she spent like 15 Gs throughout the whole process already. And then to throw a big bridge on there, that's probably going to be like an implant bridge. That's probably going to be an ex expensive prosthesis. Even that implant is, is now in a questionable position now, that number uh, 31. Mm hmm because it's almost like if I'm standing, if, if, if you ever have an injury and if you're ever supporting someone and kind of making them stand, and if you just let go, mm -hmm. all of a sudden the stress comes on your legs, right? Mm -hmm. So same thing here. That tooth was more stable because there were teeth next to it. Um, and once that goes, all of that stress is yeah. there and you see that extension in the distal. Yep. Okay, so even that, right dis that, that last tooth, number two on top, is now giving some force. Yeah. So I'm concerned about that too. Uh, so we, we have to kind of uh, give teeth in the front to kind of support and balance that bite. So now this is actually 100% not the intention of like why I made this video, but to ask you a question now, knowing that this patient has a class two and only had a few teeth remaining, would this patient have been better in doing an all on four because of their class two relationship or? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because it, Either way, when, when you restore something like this in the front, you are going to have to resort to like an FP3 kind of or an, an all on four kind of solution mm -hmm. to kind of bridge that horizontal gap. Because even when they do this, they are going to have to bridge it. They can't do single. So when you have a class relationship like that and you have implants placed like that, there's no way you're going to do singles. You're going to have to bridge everything together and make mm -hmm. it a brick bridge. So it's going to be almost like a partial all on four there, mm -hmm. um, all on three. Well, there are three implants. Um, so considering that you you can't open the bite with only three implants and with a partial prosthesis because when you open the bite you basically have to open the whole thing so if we open the bite and just on these implants obviously there's going to be an open bite in the back sides which obviously is which, which you never want to have right you want to have a very harmonious bite where all the teeth are contacting right these teeth already have a bunch of crowns on them yeah and you got to open the bite and the bone discrepancy issue. Yeah. Because if we had to do guided bone regeneration all throughout the front here, like that's going to be very expensive also. Yeah. I think that tooth should be taken out. You see that one? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That one. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. So if you're going to end up with first molar occlusion, I think in all on four will probably would be the best bet because we typically restore up to first molars when you're, if you're, especially if you're handicapped with how much 
if the mental nerve is free into your so we've already kind of talked about this too anyways but like what are your thoughts about like we because we've been talking about it all the time fp1 would fp1 have been an option in this case same deal right no not not the way we do it here like yeah. i showed you that case the other day where they staged the uh, you know fp1 kind of prosthesis there uh, but it took them five surgeries in two years because they had to augment the bone first yeah at some point the patient was in is in a removable prosthesis actually yeah um then they'd start to do the crowns and and you know the 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 current the, the restorative part but it took took it took some while you yeah. can't just jump straight to immediate lower than fp1 here right right because there's no bone where the implants need to go yeah and this it's it's in my opinion it's it's quite a bit of bone regeneration you're gonna have to do i mean i haven't seen the patient just to kind of as a disclaimer we haven't really i haven't seen the patient but it's from what it seems like with that severe class two, it's really hard to um, do an immediate load with that relationship. Right. Even if we open the bite. Right. So ridge augmentation without on the without the teeth looking extremely flared out and extremely long. I mean, it depends on the aesthetics. We see some cases done by some providers who do FP ones, and then we're like, I wouldn't want that in my mouth. And most of our patients are really picky. Yeah. So what about the aesthetics. And yeah, stuff? yeah. Aesthetics. So I think aesthetics is so subjective. If patients are okay with the aesthetics turning out non-ideal and if the patient has a low, you know, doesn't really show much of the lower lip, then maybe, yeah, but it's, it's just like almost like pigeonholing the patient into a yeah. prosthesis with this don't have. Yeah. But my other problem with that too, is that if you are like, I mean, that's a massive GBR in an unpredictable area which is less vascular, anterior mandible. Yeah. And then the other thing is like, when they're placing those implants to be where they need to be to bridge the gap for a class two relationship, like, again, I wonder what kind of like dehiscences or Yeah, you're probably gonna have to like do some custom meshes there to kind of build it, that volume up and then do the implants later on once the bone is there. Even oh, yeah. with that, you're still guarded with prognosis. Yeah, exactly. Right? It's still unpredictable. And it's gonna be insanely expensive just for the bone building procedure. Do you feel like it's more predictable to do GBR on the top versus the bottom? Oh, for sure. Yeah. 100%. Because with the tongue and it makes things complicated, right? Right. The tongue and the lack of KG. We're going to do a, like a impl a implants and simultaneous GBR on a patient here in an hour. But yeah, um, yeah way more predictable up top. Yeah. Faster. Okay, cool. I just wanted to get your thoughts on this case. And uh, yeah, I didn't even think that we were going to talk about, you know, the FP3 versus FP1 angle on this patient. but. Okay, thanks for your feedback. You're welcome.